Hi, so this is Erica Kieseweather with the Bard Conservatory, and today we have a horn and a trumpet guest who will be answering questions from their presentations on the instrument menagerie. So first we have Eleni on horn. Welcome. So I don't know if you want to say a few words or if you want to just jump right in with some questions. I assume all of you got to see her quite amazing video that she made. Um, yeah, feel free to ask me anything that wasn't clear in the video. I'm happy to play anything you want to hear or answer any questions that kind of popped into your mind. Don't be afraid. Like any question is fair game. You um, had mentioned something about um, like new and old notation. Could you kind of go into a little depth into that? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's one of the concepts that's super confusing, but um, so it's only for bass clef. So it doesn't apply to treble clef at all. It's only in the bass clef. And for horn players, old notation, typically classical early romantic era music, it's written in octave lower. So when we see it, we transpose up an octave and then we sound a fifth lower than what we're playing. So the result sounds a fourth higher than written rather than a fifth lower than written. Um, so this is something that you really only need to know if you play horn, but um, if you were example doing a score study and you're looking at the horn part and it's like way below the bottom of bass clef, like it's going like just down and down outside of the playable range, that's an old style. So it would actually be sounding a fourth higher than written. Um, so I just thought that would be a good thing to address because um, sometimes in a score, you look at the horn parts and you're like, is that playable? And the answer is no, <laughs> that's not how it would have been done. Eleni, I have a related question, which is just what composers would you most likely see this in? Is there a cutoff then when this wouldn't be happening this way anymore? Actually, no, because it it wasn't super standardized, but um, you definitely see it in Mozart. You definitely see it in Haydn. You definitely see it in anything like that. But you actually even see it in Shostakovich symphonies. Um, here, just give me one second. So um, I don't know if this is going to be super effective for me to show you, but this piece of, oh no, you can't, can you see this? No, you can only see my background. Right. Well, there we go. No. Okay. Here, let me, let me put the, <laughs> let me see if this will pick it up. Nope. Okay. Well, what I was going to show you was um, there's an excerpt from Beethoven 9 and there's also an excerpt from Shostakovich 5. And both of these pieces include old style notation. Um, and the way that you can tell that the key giveaways are that you have a descending line that instead of in Beethoven 9, it's jumping by fourths and then suddenly it jumps by an 11th. So that's not it. It's, it's just going down by fourths. Um, and then in the Shostakovich, it's going down in a scalar descent and then suddenly leaps a ninth. That's not it. It's a continued scalar descent. So those are kind of the, the keys to look for. Um, but for example, like Strauss, um, like you just see it in a lot of music, but it's also like certain publishing houses have gone back through and put everything in new notation. Certain editions keep the old notation. So yeah, um, if you were to exam, for example, to look at the opening of Ein Heldenleben, um, which is accessible on IMSLP, all of the horn parts begin with this big 2D rip, and the first written note exists outside of the range of the horn, then you play two more pitches and then leap a tenth, which is a really good sign that it's in old notation. So the first note is a playable pitch, and at no point do you leap a tenth. So that's kind of like what I would say to look for if you're doing some score study and are feeling confused um, about what's going on with that.
Okay, so if we just see it in a in base clef, really low. Also, of course. Uh, oh, thanks, Erica. Uh, I mean, we can always, you know, run it by the the, the full score as well. Uh, but okay, that's good to know. I had no idea. That's interesting. Yeah, another good thing to do is check the lowest horn part because sometimes um, it won't be clear. Like in the first, second, and third parts, it's like, well, that note would be playable up the octave or as written. But then um, if you look at the fourth horn part, that's going to be the lowest instrument part. And that one will be like really, really low, like unplayably low. And that's like, OK, it's definitely old style. Or if you look at the fourth horn part and it's still playable and you're like, OK, probably it's new style. But so this in the Heldenleben that you're seeing on Erica's screen. Thank you, Erica. Sorry, um, so I can't figure out how to write. <laughs> Well, everybody just turn your head a little bit and um, you can see that bottom note is very, very low and then you're going up in an arpeggio and then suddenly you just leap a tenth. That is a really clear sign that it is old notation for those first few pages. Right. Are there, are that, there situations where people actually end up playing the wrong octave or even there's a tradition of playing the wrong octave or there's a... I don't know, discrepancy, you know, his historical or interpretive discrepancy about which octave something should be in, or is it usually pretty obvious? Um, I'm sure that there are moments where people disagree, but thankfully most of the examples are really clear cut because at least one of the parts is in treble clef and you can understand how the harmony and how the lines are moving. Um, I will say it is something if you are coaching a youth orchestra or you're working with like younger, less experienced players and they're just like playing random notes that like don't exist um, or they're like, oh, I can't play this note. Probably they need to be instructed that it is um, um, that they need to be playing an octave up. I would say most of the times that I've seen confusion about this has been when I'm like coaching a youth orchestra section or something like that more than like in a kind of professional situation. Very interesting. Glenn, Glenn asked the question I was gonna ask. <laughs> huh? Uh, Glenn asked that, that that was what I was wondering about as well. Alani was very clear in the video. Okay, here's a question which is probably not so much for most of you guys because of your experience with orchestra, but this is maybe for the listening audience. I know that usually, except for like, what is it, uh, Beethoven 5 or Eroica has three horns? Eroica has three horns, right? But mm -hmm. usually horns come in pairs or four, right? So mm -hmm. here's the question, Alani. Why are there often five horns on stage? Yes, I think this is actually a really key question because um, there seems to be a lot of confusion about is that extra person on stage, what are they doing and how important are they and um, what does that mean? So there are four parts in the section. I described each of those roles in the video, but um, the first horn player, the principal, is the one who really plays a lot of the solos, does a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of playing high and loud and exposed. And that can be really, really taxing physically, mentally, um, and then also like just technically in terms of production on the instrument. So um, much more so in America than in Europe, um, American orchestras have a tradition of using what's called an assistant horn. Um, in the horn section, the way we're seated, um, let me just, as you can see on the horn, the bell points to the right. So in a section, we sit so that each subsequent person is in the bell of the higher chair. So second horn is sitting in first horn bell, listening to their sound and their articulation and matching. Third horn is sitting in second horn's bell. Fourth horn is sitting in third horn's bell, et cetera, et cetera. The assistant sits to the left of the principal, actually. So the assistant is kind of an island by themselves on the other side of the principal. And their role is to double the loud stuff, 
give the principal player a break if they need like a couple notes off before a solo, maybe take some of the 2D stuff so the principal horn has a chance to take a break. They're also just kind of like the emergency situation. So if your valve string breaks, the assistant gives you their horn, no questions asked in a concert. If you lose track of your rests, the assistant is sitting right next to you also counting the rests so that you never get lost. And the assistant is kind of like the unsung hero of the section because they are so vital to making sure that everyone in the section feels comfortable and sounds good. And it's kind of like the most challenging job because you just, you sit there and you rest for a really long time and then you have to come in and match everything that the principal horn has been doing and sound like the same person so that it, you don't get the effect of like, oh, now there's this random other person playing the solo or like preparing the solo, whatever, you know? So it is definitely um, an important role. And I think that sometimes people just assume that like, there are just five horns and this person on the end is the principal. And that's actually not the case. The principal is usually nested and then you have the rest of the section. Thank you. For that. Um, but it is something uh, in Europe, principal horns do not tend to have assistance and the careers actually, um, as a result, tend to be substantially shorter. Um, just because, not, not all the time, not for everyone, but for a lot of people, if you're playing Bruckner four, three nights in a week and rehearsing it the other three days, a lot of first horn playing to be doing so that's um that can be really fatiguing for some people since this is the first brass class uh, maybe just going over some other things about brass instruments so um as you see i have this horn here it's going in and out the Part of the instrument that I blow into is the mouthpiece. It's actually quite small and it's detachable. Each brass instrument has a different shape of mouthpiece. Horns tend to be more funnel-like than cup-like. Trumpets tend to be more cup-like. Um, and this is actually the whole production. Like I have to put the right note into this mouthpiece and this entire very expensive coiled instrument is just like a megaphone for what's happening in the mouthpiece. Um, so, uh, the sound that you produce on the mouthpiece, I'll demonstrate. It's actually really, um, you know how oboes do that thing where they honk their reeds a little bit, where they're like, tweet, 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 tweet. Um, brass players can do that, but like much more annoying. What you hear on the mouthpiece is just like those are the raw pitches that I would produce but you hear that the mouthpiece actually doesn't have any partials like there's nothing slotting it's just like a smooth siren going up and down so something that the brass instrument does is provide harmonics so you can't play that smooth siren effect on the horn instead it slots into the overtone or harmonic series so I'll demonstrate that so the harmonic series is the same for all instruments. Um, we all work within it, but as you hear, the harmonics get closer and closer together the higher you go. Um, so this is why in the low register, you tend to get scooping more than chipping. Like you're going to get the right note, but maybe you go nah, because the partials are far enough apart that you don't miss the note. You just don't quite center the pitch. And then in the high range, you're much more likely to chip because the partials, especially as you get up in the range, the partials are increasingly like not even half steps apart. And so as a result, it can be really tricky to pick out exactly the right one that you're going for. Elena, um, I, hate, I hate to ask you to do this, but um, I actually had never heard anybody use the word chip uh, until you started using it in class. I, oh. I just didn't know uh, because sure. I hang around horn players. 
Um, <laughs> and I hate to ask you to do this, but could you chip a few notes so we know what you're talking about? With pleasure. Um, so other euphemisms you might hear, crack, frack, clam, chip, flub. Uh, we have a lot of different diction to refer to this phenomenon, but essentially it's any attack which does not result in the immediate production of the correct note. So, for example, that's a pretty centered attack. I just release the air, I bring my tongue down, I release the air, and I'm buzzing and I start the note. I release the tongue, I blow the wrong partial, it kind of slides down into the right partial, and then I hold the note. So, um, it's not something that I would say you should find in like disturbing or alarming horn players. I'm sorry, but the last instrument in the orchestra to stop missing notes are the horns. Um, if you go to a major professional orchestra concert, if any teeny tiny thing goes even slightly wrong, it's probably a horn player sliding into or out of a pitch or not, you know, something like that. It happens, it's not the end of the world, it doesn't interrupt musicality, it doesn't interrupt phrasing. Um, and it's just, you know, it's part of that appeal of a natural and organic live performance. That's what happens in live performance. The recording is flawless, but in the live performance, you get a little bit of that thing. Um, some conductors more so than others have some words to say about chip notes. Um, and I think in general, uh, the more you talk about chips, kind of the worse it gets. So if you're conducting, say, the opening of Mahler 1, which begins with this, you know, you have the clarinet stuff, whatever, but then you get this big horn duet, and it's like this big, lush, romantic horn moment, and let's say somebody chips a note somewhere in there as a conductor, I would advocate, probably you don't want to be like, excuse me, horns, I'm hearing a clam in there. Um, just because I think frequently that can start like a really negative internal dialogue and people can really spiral. If it's something that's like really egregious, maybe just give them another shot. But um, yeah, that's just something to kind of be aware of. Um, and just to kind of talk about why it happens. Uh, so we play within the harmonic series, which is what I demonstrated. And on each valve combination, we have the ability to play about 20 different notes, <laughs> you know? So it's unlike on the woodwinds where the valves have a greater role in determining exactly what pitch is going to be produced on the horn. All of those notes I played were on the same fingering. So it really comes down to your face and your ear to um, produce a correct pitch. Um, I, I have something related to that also. Um, sure. As some of you know, I am or was a violinist. And violinists are only behind pianists in how many hours a day they think that they need to be playing. So, you know, if a pianist practices eight hours a day, a violinist usually practices at least five. And it, as a member of a first violin section, I mean, you're, we're basically just playing all the time. And we don't think anything really of having a conductor go over and over a passage that's difficult for us. In fact, we kind of like it because we might get better. And I have started to realize over the years that you horn players really don't appreciate that at all. So could you just talk a little bit about that, this fatigue factor and, and how some conductors will overuse the section while maybe while they're trying to fix something else, actually, not even your section. Sure. Um, yeah, just to talk a little bit about endurance on brass instruments. Um, for a beginner, like middle and high school brass student, we usually say 30 to 60 minutes a day. And then if you're serious about playing the horn, um, the standard recommendation is about three hours of practice a day. Some brass players do much more. They practice about five. Some brass players stick closer to two. But um, most brass players will not be practicing eight hours a day just because the endurance is a lot different because the muscular part of our body that we're working with is these teeny baby muscles inside the lips and this ring shaped muscle that goes around your mouth called the ocular orus which is what we do when we 
engage our corners to provide support so that you're not just mushing your lips into oblivion. Um, so that kind of covers endurance for brass instruments. Um, and in rehearsal settings, it can be really fatiguing to go over a passage over and over and over again, particularly things that are more taxing are going to be things that are really high or really loud or really high and really loud. <laughs> Um, so if we're just hitting the passage over and over and over again, um, say we're trying to correct like a 2D passage and the violins, sorry violins, but say maybe the violins are not quite together, rather than making the whole orchestra kind of hammer it out for 15, 20 minutes, maybe just isolate the issue and then throw the brass players back in once things are a little more settled. Um, the other thing that's important to remember about brass players is that, I mean, everyone does need breaks in rehearsals. Mentally, you can only focus for so long. And then physically, like sitting for super long periods of time without stretching can be taxing. So I'm not trying to say that brass players, like, we need breaks and no one else does. But it is really important that you structure your rehearsals around giving your brass players breaks. Because if you're rehearsing for, say, four hours and you give your brass players a break at the three hour mark, that's probably not great. You know, try to split it in the middle and try to be um, cognizant of the fact that we are using our faces, <laughs> you know, we're using just a little tiny piece of our musculature to do all of the heavy lifting. So um, yeah, I think that's something to just maybe think about. But that's being said, don't feel like you can't rehearse the brass section. Like, don't feel like, oh, I can only do this once with them and then I need to let them rest. It's like, you know, hypothetically, we're all staying in good shape. We're all doing our physical routines. We're doing technique work. So we're ready to go. Just don't be an abuser. You know, don't, don't work us to death. Um, Hi. Um... Oh, go ahead. No, oh, well. no, I was going to say, does anyone have any questions? And yeah, like, sure. Yeah, um, it's like I had like a very, very brief career as a librarian slash stage hand crew guy. So like I got a chance to actually see um your parts and I had it like, is it difficult uh, when your part is not an F to uh, transpose? If it's like a part in E or whatever, is that difficult for you guys? That is a super good question. I'm, I do talk a little bit about transposition in my video, but just to kind of go over it, um, modern horn stands in F, but that was really a decision that wasn't made until the mid to late 1800s in some cases. So transposition is an expected skill. You can expect that your horn players know how to transpose into the standard keys, which is E, E flat, D, C, B, B flat basso, um, B flat alto, A and G. Um, with that being said, modern music, like if you're composing something for horn now, unless there's a very specific artistic reason for you to not put it in F, you should put it in F. Um, but I would say the biggest challenge for horn players with transposing, most people can transpose at sight. I would say that's kind of an expectation in most upper level groups um, in terms of at a school and definitely in a professional orchestra. But sometimes the conductor is like, Horns, what's your concert pitch? And we're in B flat basso. We look at the part, we transpose it into F, and then we transpose that to concert pitch. Sometimes there's a lot of mental math that's happening. So if you ask the horns like, what's your concert pitch? And they're like, hmm, and like thinking for a while, don't take that as they don't know what they're doing. They might just be like, you know, doing their mental math to get all the way there. Um, Did you want to, oh, the, the two things that we thought we might want to do a little bit were to show some mutes and maybe to show a little bit of natural horn stuff. Um, but if there are other questions from the conductors we, or from Adriana, we can certainly go there instead. Hi, I had one question. Sure. First, uh, Eleni, thank you so much for um, doing this. Honestly, I've never had much experience writing for French horn, especially. And uh, so this is really exciting to have this opportunity to talk to you. But um, uh, so I, I am a composer and I'm really interested in like writing um, 
like uh, multi-horn parts uh, and arranging harmonies for multi multiple horns, but I was wondering what it's like for a French horn to blend with like a few saxes, you know, a trombone, what would it, like, are you guys able to do a tootie line that would follow kind of the articulations of those horns or uh, do you find that you operate more as a sec of like a French horn section? Um, yeah, I think that's a super good question because um, horn occupies this kind of weird, ambiguous space in a lot of orchestral writing where it is treated sometimes as its own thing. It's treated sometimes as like an auxiliary to viola and cello. You see that a lot um, in Dvorak and in, um, you know, Brahms, you get these like 2D horn and cello passages that come up. Um, and then you also see the horn in big brass tooties. I think the horn works well in any of these contexts, but it's just important to think about balance. The horn is not a directional instrument, meaning that your trombone, like the bell points straight out and it's going, you know, it's directed at you, whereas the horn kind of points backwards. So it has to bounce off of something else and then go out into the house. And so sometimes it's not to say that horns don't project, but sometimes our projecting power is not the same. So just be mindful about how you're writing for horn in 2D moments. Um, but yeah, I think horn matches really well with the other instruments of the brass family, especially if you're seeing, um, sometimes you actually see this in scores, but sometimes the fourth horn is actually kind of more written with the trombones than with the other horns. Sometimes you get that in like brass chorales. Uh, so definitely feel free to write the horn with the trombones and that. Um, in terms of pairing the horn with saxes, that is uh, something that happens a lot in band literature because the horn and the sax can occupy a similar range um, and they do, they can achieve a similar color. The thing to look out for the air is that the sax can easily overwhelm the horn and the horn has a little bit more mellowness um, and a little bit more like, don't take this as saxophone hate, but a little bit more richness and depth. Whereas the saxophone is an instrument that is not a brass instrument. It's not as long. It doesn't have a, um, you know, it doesn't have the same kind of conical bore, dark, rich, you know, it was developed for a really different purpose. So when you're pairing horn with saxes, be aware that the articulation mechanism is really different. Saxes are a single reed, you know, and they have it in their mouth with a mouthpiece. So the way that they articulate and their response time is going to be different than the horn. I think in general, horn players and saxophone players can be at the same time. Like, it's not like we're never going to line up. Just be mindful of that. Um, and saxophones can definitely play a lot, a lot faster technique than horns. So if you, something that a saxophone player will just be like, you know, horn players, that's a lot of moving around in the face for us. Does that answer your question or do you have like more specific questions about doing that? Oh, I really appreciate that. The, the articulation, especially the, um, the quickness that a horn player can, you know, pro might struggle with more than a sax player. Yeah, sax can kind of noodle along. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's super informative. Thank you. Cool. Um, and yeah, you can definitely, a lot of band literature features moments um, with horn and saxophone playing together. You can, uh, David Maslanka, I think, tends to handle those sections really well. So maybe try to get your hands on some of his scores um, and just see what he does. Anybody want to hear a couple of mute differences in real time? Thumbs up or thumb. Okay, so um, I have horns. Unlike trumpet players, we don't really have like a big bag of mutes that we carry around with us for standard orchestral stuff. Sometimes you'll see things written for horn, like different mutes, like a plunger mute or whatever. Um, but just be careful that it actually exists. Um, like we don't have the, like a Harmon mute. The closest thing we can do is put a bass trombone Harmon mute with like extra stuff on the corks in our bell, but it does not sound amazing and it is very hard to tune. Um, so the only standard orchestral mute we have is this. It is a straight mute. Most players 
will opt for a wooden straight mute. It is tunable. Um, if you put your finger in here, there's um, a little lever that you can move up and down to adjust the tuning of the mute. High school players typically have ones that are made out of cardboard. They cost like $25 and they sound like garbage. They're terrible. Um, there are some people who play metal mutes. Most of those also sound like garbage. The wood is really the way to go. But um, if you don't have the same kind of mute, the sound might not match super well. So that's something to maybe be aware of. Maybe specify like wooden straight mute. Um, but this is a pretty standard straight mute. If you say straight mute, most people are gonna go for this. Um, typically putting mutes for brass players in general, putting mutes makes you a little bit sharper because it shortens the instrument. Um, so usually you have to think down, low, use slightly lower fingerings if you're gonna be using the mute. Um, and the other thing to think about is for horn players, we keep our right hands in the bell at all times, except when we have mutes in. And we use it to kind of shade pitch. It's something I don't even think about now, but there are certain pitches that I know sit high for me on my instrument. So I like instinctively will shade my hand a little bit to bring the pitch down or open my hand a little bit for the flat notes to bring them up a little bit. Um, so when I have a mute in, I can't make those micro adjustments as easily. But, so this is a straight mute. Um, you just pop it in the bell. So I'll play. I don't know if my mic is super good. Can you hear a difference between that? Oh, for sure, absolutely. Cool. Um, so the ways that you typically will see the mute used, you can use it to change color. Um, you hear that there's like just a difference in resonant and um, sound with the mute, but it's also really good if you've written something that's really, really soft and you really want to just change up how um, how the horn is resonating, um, especially super soft stuff and you want the horn to kind of like fade out into the distance, you definitely put a mute in it. Um, you will also see mute sometimes if you want it to sound like it's far away, you can just put the mute in and that will make it sound kind of more distant. Um, the other common mute that we do is actually the hand. Um, you can go fully stopped. During the natural horn, no valves period, this was a way of changing pitch. Now that we have valves, this is no longer really a way of changing pitch so much as it is a way of changing color. Um, you definitely see this a lot more in French music. Um, it's used with a lot of nuance in the music of Debussy um, and uh, other, other French composers, especially the Impressionists who are really interested in color. Um, you see a lot of that, but so in the bell, usually my hand looks about like this. So as you can see, there's a lot of room in there. It's pretty open. My hand is just shading. When I'm stopped, I completely close my hand inside the bell. Um, obviously, the bell size is not standard on modern horns, and hand size is definitely not standard um, between horn players. Um, some people are like, men do stopped horn better because they have bigger hands, and I don't think that's necessarily the case, but um, in fact, I think it's not the case, but that's just something to be aware of. So let me do. So did you hear it's, it's really brassy. Um, it is not a sound that projects immensely well, but it is something that's like a really different color. Uh, something to kind of be aware of is that low horn stopped is very, very unstable. So, um, uh, like things that are low and stopped don't project and they're really unstable. Um, and then the other thing that I would say about stopped horn is that you do just want to be mindful that 
stop horn can be really difficult to tune. So especially if you're in like a Mahler symphony, something like that, where you have like these gestopped, which is stopped in German, you have these gestopped moments. Um, that might be something that the horn section needs to get together and tune, or you might need to say like, oh, let's, uh, let's tune this. Um, stopped horn, I think is most effectively used as like a color difference for like a very special effect. Hindemith in his wind quintet wrote an entire movement that's just the horn is stopped the entire time. I think most horn players will kind of raise an eyebrow to that because it is kind of like, well, it's not really a special effect if I do it for two pages. Um, stopped horn does also tend to get kind of fatiguing, so it's not in anyone's best interest to do that for a really long time. But um, that kind of covers our two standard orchestral mutes. Um, do you yeah. Want to quickly do a little bit about, um, I it seems that the natural form thing also goes with the altering the pitch with the hand. I remember when you showed this in class, it was pretty interesting. Would that be worth going over one more time? Or I don't mean to wind you up to make you do that, but. Yeah, of course. So um, as I talked about in my video, I had some pictures of the natural horn with the crooks and stuff. Um, today I have valves. That's how I changed through the harmonic series and I use my lips to identify the pitch. But um, before that, this is kind of something that's interesting. Horn is the only brass instrument that is valved with the left hand. I think some tubas have left hand valve systems maybe, but horn is the only one that like really comes standard. Everybody fingers with the left hand. And the reason for that is that initially the way that you changed pitch was with the right hand. So horn was a right handed instrument just like every other Western instrument. Um, so uh, it might sound a little weird and a little pitchy to you, but um, just remember that in the classical era, people were used to kind of negotiable intonation. So let me just play. So that's like a standard scale. As you can see, I'm moving my valves around, right? Like I'm moving my fingers. Um, now I'm gonna play it without the fingers and using this hand instead. <laughs> So, um, in the hands of like a real natural horn virtuoso, someone at the Paris Conservatory in the kind of mid to late 1800s, I'm sure it would have sounded great. We have some natural horn stuff that's been written that's just honestly really difficult to play with valves and like seemingly impossible without, but we know that we're doing it. That being said, um, when you are opening and closing your hand in the bell, it changes the tone, it changes the projection, and that's really what the incentive to create this instrument that has valves and it's much more easy to match stuff on. That's really where that came from. Um, does anyone have any last questions, thoughts? No. Hi, Yelani. Um, I wonder if you could talk about the triple horn. I heard uh, the Vienna or Vienna Philharmonic Z zero horns can can sound brassy, but without over too much overshadowing the others. I wonder if there's um, if the triple horn by adding another F two can affect the the sounding um, like in this way. Yeah, absolutely. That's a super good question. So um, I'm just going to unpack that a little bit because the Vienna Horn actually, the Vienna Philharmonic and Vienna State Opera, both of these organizations actually still play what are called Vienna Horns, which is different than the horn that I have. This horn is a standard yellow brass gyre wrap and it has uh, rotary valves. So when I depress the valve, um, it changes, it moves, it just moves a rotor, the valve rotates. The Vienna horns have what are called pumpen valves, 
That's P-U-M-P-E-N, it's German. Um, pumpen valves. And the pumpen valves are actually a valve system that was developed, I believe, in the 1840s, maybe. These are quite old. And the Vienna Philharmonic still plays on this valve system. It gives the horns a different richness and a different depth of color. If you want like a really quick sample of that, listen to some place like Chicago Symphony play Rosen Cavalier Suite, and then listen to Vienna Phil play Rosen Cavalier Suite. And you'll be like, is this the same piece? So it's super different. Um, but that is what's happening there. That's the difference in the darkness and the color. So that's a Vienna horn. A triple horn is actually a different thing, um, which is not an instrument that's typically played in Vienna, but actually is played in many other orchestras internationally. So this double horn, just to talk horn stuff, is technically an F horn. So my front row of valve slides, one, two, and three, are my F slides. So this one is an E flat slide, an E natural slide, and a D slide. When I depress the trigger, I get to use these back valve slides, which gives me higher keys because depressing the trigger moves me into B flat alto horn. Um, this is not how I'm thinking about it. I'm not like, oh, I'm playing a C on a B flat alto. I'm not transposing. We just use a standard fingering chart. You know, I'm like, oh, this fingering is T2, but I'm just giving you the background for what that is. On a triple horn, you actually have an additional set of slides. You have three more slides, and those are even smaller, and those are going to be either an E flat alto horn or an F alto horn. I'd say E flat alto horn is a little bit more common, but you can get either one. The reason to have a triple horn is to have more options for alternative fingerings, greater security in the high range, and um, kind of more options to create like smoother slurs because you have greater fingering choices in the mid to high register. Um, a lot of principal players play triple horns, especially in big orchestras, um, and they're growing more and more popular. Uh, they were invented, the first triple horn was invented in the 1960s by Paxman. That was the first widely available triple horn. But um, the triple horn is kind of, principal players either have the triple horn or they have something called a descant horn. A descant horn is a smaller, lighter version of the horn. And instead of having the low F and the B flat, you get the B flat and then a high E or high F. So it's just the higher side of the horn. Um, for example, if you're playing the quonium from Bach B minor mass, you would play it on your high horn. And then, you know, if you're playing a Strauss or something where you need the full range of the instrument, then you play it on your double horn. And then those two were combined into the triple horn. The downside of the triple horn is that it's very heavy and it can be kind of cumbersome. It weighs a lot more because it's got a lot more metal. So some players prefer the triple horn, they play it for everything. Some people will only play the triple horn if they're playing something really high and taxing, and then they'll do the double horn the rest of the time. Some people prefer to have a descant and a double. It's really a personal preference thing rather than a standard. That's a, that was an amazing question. I didn't even know there was such a thing. I'm curious if you know what are some of our faculty members like Jeff Lang from the Philly Orchestra and Julie Landsman from the Met Opera or, or Julie Pilant would, would be playing or would have played. Do you have any idea? Absolutely. This is something that our players talk about a lot. Like when you meet someone like socially or academically, like you're studying with them, one of the first things is like, oh, what horn do you play? And then if it's like a teacher, they're like, oh, let me try your horn. So you, um, you know that. Uh, so my horn, Horns can be made out of a variety of metals, yellow brass, nickel silver, or rose brass. Nickel silver tends to be darker, yellow brass tends to be brighter. Yellow brass responds faster, nickel silver responds slower. Uh, that rose brass, not that many people play it. It's really dark, it's a little sluggish. People don't like it that much. My horn's yellow brass, um, and it's a gyre wrap, which means that I have one, two, three, and then I have my trigger valve, which moves me from F to B flat. The other wrap is a crispy wrap where you have one, two, three, and then the trigger valve is here. It just changes the configuration of the tubing and changes the sound. So Julie Landsman of the Met plays a nickel silver crispy wrap. She's very dedicated to it. One particular one called the Con AD. 
Um, so she's super into that. Jeff Lang plays a horn similar to mine. It's a yellow brass gyre wrap. Julie Pilant plays a yellow brass gyre wrap, and so does Barbara Yoselin Curie. Um, one of my teachers has um, a triple that he's really devoted to, and then he has a few double horns that he kind of rotates in. Um, so it it really it can be really personal. There are some orchestras that play exclusively a certain kind of horn. For example, the Cleveland Orchestra for a long time was a yellow, was a nickel silver crispy wrap section. Um, so they all played that kind of horn. Now there's a little more flexibility in most orchestras, but yeah, that is something that horn players love to talk about. <laughs> Sounds like violinists with bows, believe it or not, but that'll be for another session. I wonder if we should move on to Ricardo because eventually people might want to have dinner. Um, so if there's any last quick question, Justin, you were, you were late to the game. Is there anything you definitely want to ask Eleni? I, I saw a no and a smile. I didn't hear you, but. <laughs> um, I'm okay. I don't have anything specific. Uh, then um, thank you so much, and let's let's move on to to Ricardo and the trumpet. Thank you, Ricardo. Hi guys, amazing job, Eleni. Thank you for your amazing video, also, Ricardo. And um, I'm sure there must be some questions coming out of that. Please go for it. <laughs> it, 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 it. I have to say, Eleni did a really good job. Uh, the trumpet and horn had a lot of similar things. Not everything, but it's, it's with her explanation, you know, like the mouthpiece, all that stuff that's in the mutes. She, even the mutes, she kind of gave a good example because she even mentioned the trumpet mute. So, do you want to shoot? Go for it. Because we would love, like, we would love to hear the harmon mute, maybe a couple of other things like that. I, I actually don't owe a harmon mute because my harmon mute broke and the stem broke. Oh. Uh, and I think Sidhu has it. <laughs> I think he forgot to give it back to me. But right now I got, I actually got a, a straight mute. I got a cut mute. I'm going to change my, my background really quick because I have my, my hijack background. As you guys can see, I'm right there still. So. Yeah, your teachers are really fooled by that, Ricardo. <laughs> so um please go for it. any questions or sh should i just i mean if you want to could you uh i mean if you want to play uh, the mutes and uh could you kind of talk about um like how i uh, like the embouchure and stuff works because yeah, like i had great. a methods class like an undergrad but it was kind of like but yeah if you could talk about that um and, and then I'm, I'm gonna move to the mutes erica and um, that's a good question this is the reason it took me so long to actually uh, do this video because when I started to talk about this, I would just go for 15 minutes. You know, and, and Erica knows that I have no problem going for 15 minutes. So we're really kids, you know. But anyways, to make the story short, uh, it's very important to remember that we definitely, in, and this is in all brass instruments uh, generally, we produce the sound through the vibration of the upper and lower lip. For horn, it changes a little, a, a, a little. I, 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 Eleni can't explain because I know like um, there is a different, I know horn players use uh, different techniques, what they call the Farkas amateur, uh, that is way back on the day. But for example, we, we, we produce these, 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 this vibration that we call buzzing uh, through the support of air and the amateur. The amateur is, is what is going to keep our lips together, uh, and it's going to uh, and it's going to uh, they're going to vibrate together. Uh, I, I only had one studio in my whole life. That was back in Costa Rica. I have six six kids, and the way I will teach them how to do the amateur because a lot a lot of them really, a lot of them, a lot of them had a lot of issues. So a lot of them could, could get them. So I will make them to say mom, say say mom, mommy, like 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 in English. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Once you get them to say M, that's the most natural thing that you can do. Once you got that M and you got the corners locked up, you try to do that buzzing. That is pretty much like, you know, when you try to do that elephant sound, but it's kind of the same concept. As a matter of fact, some people can even do what they call free buzzing. That is, they can buzz notes on their lips. Like, 
kind of something like that, not necessarily excellent, but that's, that's like the basics of, of buzzing. And I'd like to see like a, a, like a pyramid, you know, if you have the air, you have the amateur, and you have, I'm missing one, something else, uh, support actually, and you have the right support, um, you will be able to produce a, 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 you know, sound. Although um, I have to say, guys, make trumpet sound pretty is quite a challenge. Like it comes, it comes is quite challenging. I like to say that trumpet, out of all the brass instruments, is the less evolved out of, out of all the brass instruments. Somehow, even though after uh, Reno Schilke invented the tuning trumpet in 1950 something, 1958, the trumpet really hasn't changed much. The only changes the trumpet has had has been through the German rap. That is kind of, kind of the same thing that Eleni talked about it. As you guys know, and I talk a little, I said this fast in the video, this is a French rap, pistons. When you say pistons, that's French rap. When you see rotaries, the one that goes like this, and he has the, it looks like a, has the horn, that's the German, German rap. And he's mostly used in all, in all uh, Europe, Europe. Some orchestras in the United States are starting to use it, you know, to play traditional music, such as Brahms, Beethoven, even Mozart. Tone does it, and they got wonderful rotary trumpets. As a matter of fact, rotary trumpets are built a little bigger than the piston trumpets. They got also a little more metal, a little more heavy, and the belt is bigger. So they produce this dark tone that I remember that when I played with James uh, last year, the classical concert, we play, I forgot what we played, uh, Aragon, something like that. Um, the trumpet is like healthy for your playing because it's big, it's warm, it lets you blow through it. You go back to the piston trumpet and you feel like you can play anything. That's the reason I feel German orchestras, when Strauss comes, they gotta play Alpine Symphony. They go to rotary trumpets. And they were so smart that they created these things called uh, giving clappings. I don't know, my German, my German is, is not very good. But anyways, um, these keys, what they do, there's something important that we need to remember about brass. When we play, we have something called back pressure. You know, that means, and, and I'm going to do a quick explanation about this uh, because uh, let me really talk about the mouthpieces and I thought it was great that you talk about that. When you blow through the mouthpiece, you need to understand that when that vibration is happening, we trumpet players have to grab all that air that we have and we have to fit it in this big rim and this really small hole. What, so it physics wise, what happens is like when the air is trying to go through the hole, since the hole is so tiny, it's gonna come back and it's gonna hit you back in your lips. So that's the reason you see people dying and you see them red and all that. That is the back pressure. It's all the oxygen accumulating because you can't put it all because you are, you know, you're, maybe you are a little bit tense, maybe you're a little tired, etc., etc. So when that happens, the reason I wanted to talk about that is because that is what happens with trumpet. Trombones, horns, and tubas, they have a different kind of story. Since, since horn is so conic, they, they get a little more depth. They, get a little, they still get that back pressure. But me, that I have tested the horn, I mean, in comparison with the trumpet, you can feel a lot different. Same with the trombone and with a tuba. Wow. I mean, me, that I play trumpet, playing a tuba is like I run out of air like in two notes. Mira, mira. So, so, but it's also a good exercise. Um, so anyways, I was talking about uh, back pressure. I kind of got a little bit out of classic. But anyways, I mean, that was the amateur kind of concept and, and, and I just wanted to talk a little bit about that. Um, oh, I remember. So when people play Alpine Symphony, what the Germans did is like they grab, since they realized that the trumpet has so much back pressure built up naturally because he's so unrefined and he's so out of tune. What they did is like they grabbed their main tuning slide. I wish I had the rotary trumpet with me, you know, and, and they create and, and they poke three holes. They broke, they, they kept this hole, the tuning slide hole. They poke one here and they poke another one here. So what they do is like when it's time to play high notes, the effort that you use to play a high, a high E, a high E, you, by pressing one of those keys precisely in the correct way, it will release the air, it will release the pressure, and it will let you, with the force that you play, and E, play a high C, a high D. So we don't have to kill each other so much. So when you see people like 
Like, I remember when I was growing up, I will see, like, Vienna Philharmonic. That's a great example, playing Alpine Symphony. And I'll see the guy just hit the high B and just be like, how does he do it? How people do it in, how does, Mother 7 sounded so incredible. Every, every single high C was the same color and same in tune. It was, it was, how do they do it? And then I started to realize that they were using all these keys. And it's fantastic. I think it's like, I think it's amazing. Although, uh, rotary trumpets are quite expensive because they're so advanced technology-wise. And sorry, I got a little off, uh, but yeah, those are the concepts of really, buzzing. It's really interesting. It's really interesting. So, I mean, the way you're describing it, it sounded like these guys were like just going back into their garage and taking an, a little, you know, making a little hole. But you're saying basically they ended up, or was that they were experimenting and then it was designed this way? It was not one like this, right? Well, it's not just I've taken a little ice pick and. Well, well I, mean, I, I do that. I know I shouldn't do that with my trumpets, but I do that. You know, I, I for example, this is my seat trumpet. I, I have this, you know, I, I have my seat trumpet, I have this trumpet, and I actually have a, an extra tuning slide that I built myself that I was trying to actually mess with it, but maybe the results were not as good. <laughs> but like, you know, I feel that every trumpet player, uh, at a certain point, all we were trying to look is like, you know, making the job easier, making the sound good, at least on, on my part, that's what I'm trying, you know, I, 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 I want to sound perfect, but I don't want to look like I'm dying. Uh, <laughs> so I think we all maybe experiment in that in that in that part. My dad is a brass player. My dad plays bass trombone. He was ten years bass bass trombone of National Symphony in Costa Rica. Then he retired, and then he got like a principal job in a military band. And he had his own shop where he repaired brass instruments. So I learned oh, I like not it. not a lot, not a lot, because he was a full time musician. He also had his own salsa group and. So he couldn't, he was his side job. But like, yeah, I mean, my first trumpet, my dad kind of built it for me. He was just literally parts from all a bunch of trumpets. He just put it together. He's like, okay, let's try to make this work. So I messed with some things or two, but not too much. Wow, that's, that's, really, that's really interesting. Other questions? I haven't done it in a long time, although it was, this was back when I was like starting, maybe 16, 15. It's, it's cool. Um, are there questions for Ricardo about the trumpet or trumpet music or what it's like to be a mutes, people, people different types of trumpets? Well, like the reason I asked about the amateur because like I found that you guys are extremely responsive. So like James like tells us all the time, like if you guys conduct something like really tight, then they'll play that way. If you like kind of loosen up, then they'll play that way too. So like that's that's like kind of what I was asking. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, well. I, yeah, man. When James conducts, I like to follow him. <laughs> so at least when he when he we have worked together, at least he he's good transmitting energies. At least to me, you know, like sitting in the back of the orchestra when we played that prize piece, it was easy, you know. But like get, you know, I wanted to get that Wild West. You know, I'm not from here, guys. I wanted to get it, you know. And and I feel he kind of like laid really really nice. Um, I. I have to say that the trumpet players here are about excellent, for real. Every single one of them are, there is some good talent here. So I have to say you guys are experiencing a great level of trumpet playing. Even though sometimes, um, you know, we still make our mistakes, you know, talking about myself specifically, but uh, I think you guys have had a good experience. Uh, <laughs> I was a fellow graduate in a school where, in a state school where we had a studio of 30 people and I had like, what, it was three kids for myself to teach and man trumpet ensemble was like horrible like oof. i was it was not a good experience guys it was not because some people you know some kids just don't care you know they just don't care they just there because they got scholarship so anyways i don't think you can study with ed carroll and carl albeck and not care yeah that's, that's i have I, you guys have no idea like it's i've been recording like this eighth it's for Carl, you know, and ah. <laughs> it's like a lot. <laughs> it's good stuff, although. Coronavirus, torture your teacher with etudes week. I think it's great because I think I needed to go, I just think I just needed time to practice. <laughs> All these yeah, updates that I had, had me like crazy. I think a lot of people are hunkering down actually in a, in a good kind of way with their music. Yeah. 
Other questions for Ricardo? He obviously knows a lot and he loves to talk about what he knows too. <laughs> Ricky syndrome. <laughs> Shush. <laughs> yeah, I was I was gonna say like what, what Glenn said earlier about James talking about uh the way you conduct really, really affecting the ambassador, like he said, you were probably there in a what are the ensembles like I actually don't oh no, maybe it was I can't remember if Adam was there, but he was like, actually, when you're about to cue like a trumpet player or something, don't smile at them because <laughs> they'll smile back at you like instinctively and it'll ruin their embouchure. So he's like, when you're going to cue, you know, a trumpet player or something, don't, don't smile. Just give them the like, the knowing look. <laughs> That's funny. Which That's I thought funny. was really interesting. Yeah. I, I was, I always wondered that because like people talk about, uh, People talk about that with singers a lot, like the way you conduct will affect the physical mechanism that produces the sound. Um, but, you know, I always sort of wondered what instruments were more sensitive to that in that same way. Because I sort of sense that like violins, not as much, you know, or like a lot of string instruments, not as much. Um, yeah, I, I... So I, I figured brass was the most sensitive, yeah. <laughs> This is going to sound very egocentric, but what I'm about to say, um, back in the day, one, probably one of the most famous orchestral trumpet players out there, you know, uh, his name was Bud Herset, Adolf Herset, principal trumpet of Chicago Symphony for I don't know how many years, an icon. Uh, I think once they asked him, like, what do you like about being first trumpet of the Chicago Symphony? And he said something like, like, because I get to conduct from the back of the orchestra. And they ask him, why do you think that? And it's like, you won't find something more responsive than a trumpet player. Like, trumpet players, they have this, what was, what was it? Time first, I think I remember. They have this saying, that it's like, time first. It's all about, uh, something it's all about time, so. Uh, but this was, you know, like, this was back in the day, you know. Herseth retired in 2000 or something like. And, you know, he was like really old and, you know, Chicago brass, you know, I don't know what you mean. <laughs> Schulte all the way. Schulte all the way. Yes, please. <laughs> I don't think it's a mistake. Or, I mean, I think it connects to what you're saying that, that Jerry Schwartz became a conductor. You know, he was the principal trumpet of the, of the New York Philharmonic when he was young. And uh, yeah, that's correct. He he'd rather steer the ship from the front than the back. Jerry Schwartz is, is a legend as well because he just didn't become an amazing conductor. He's amazing. I mean, I, have you guys seen the All-Stars? Fantastico, fantastico, like Tandon like will say, but um, I think he was able to, what was it? He, I think he recorded most of tropical literature. He did recordings of almost everything. And then he literally was like, I'm pretty good. I'm good. I'm gonna become a conductor. <laughs> Other questions yeah. for Ricky? Ricardo? Yeah, the both of you guys, the, the videos are honestly very helpful and very uh, thorough. So a lot of the questions I had originally were answered in the videos. Yeah, it's true, um, actually. It's, it's yeah. <laughs> These are great. These are going to go in prime time. So, all right. Well, thank you guys. Next week, um, I will send you very soon. The oboe one is done. I think it's oboe and clarinet, I'm pretty sure. Uh, so the woodwind day. And um, yeah, thank, thank you both very much. And thank you guys for taking this all so seriously. I know it's going to help your... Future Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.